I trusted her with everything. My heart, my soul, my life. But that day, everything shattered. I caught her, my beautiful wife, in the arms of another man. The betrayal cut deeper than any wound. As I stood there, accusing her, the room filled with shadows of deceit. Her tears meant nothing. The damage was done. I packed my bags, leaving behind a life built on lies. Revenge was the only thing on my mind. This is the story of how trust turned into the darkest betrayal. My name is Tim Robinson. This past year has been terrible. There are three reasons for that. First, I had a motorcycle accident a little over a year ago. A truck driver didn't see me and hit me. After that, I could only blink and breathe. I could swallow with difficulty, but only liquids or very soft food. I couldn't chew, speak, or feel anything below my neck. The doctor said I was lucky to be alive, and I received a multi-million dollar settlement from the trucking company. All my medical expenses were covered, and I received a monthly stipend to support my wife and me for life. My wife, Beth, decided to take care of me, and we thought we would be okay financially. I stayed in the hospital for six months before coming home, and that's when things got worse. How did it get worse? The counselor asked, looking at me closely. I'm so ashamed. I don't think I can even talk about what happened during those six months, I said, a tear falling down my cheek. That's okay, she replied. Everything you say here is confidential. I'm here to help you heal. I nodded and took a sip of water before continuing. Let's start with your marriage. Tell me about that. I told her about my marriage to Beth, how we met in college, then married after we graduated. At the time of my accident, I was 25 and we had been married for three years. I was a mechanical engineer and she was a paralegal for a big law firm. We lived in a large three-bedroom apartment. We planned to turn one bedroom into a nursery. The second bedroom was our office, but after my accident, it became my room because it could fit all my medical equipment. Beth tried to take care of me at first, but it was too much for her, especially the bathroom stuff, so she sought help. Our neighbors, Don and Kathy Akins, offered to help. Don was an attorney at Beth's firm, and he often drove her to work. Kathy was a nurse at a local hospital and would check on me sometimes. Beth got a home health nurse to check on me during the day, but it was clear that even with help, she couldn't handle it. That's when Don stepped in. It started innocently enough, I explained, but I could tell he had a thing for my wife. She often cried, and he was always there to comfort her. I could hear them making out on our couch, then he would take her to our bedroom and have sex with her. It didn't end there, did it? The counselor asked. I shook my head. No, I said. Afterward, he would come into my room and tell me how he felt after being with my wife. I saw the look on the counselor's face. Sorry, I said. Where was his wife during all this? The counselor asked. Was she working? Yes, she worked strange shifts and was often gone all night, I replied. I see the counselor said. Go on. I took a deep breath. After about a month of that, he came into my room while Beth was taking a shower. I was too ashamed to finish. Did he abuse you? The counselor asked. I nodded, wiping tears from my face. Yes, I said quietly. How often? The counselor asked. A couple of times a week for about four months, I said. He even told me he would bring his friends over to have fun with me. Did your wife know? the counselor asked. I don't know, I shrugged. She wasn't there when it happened, but she often talked about how good it was to have friends like Don to help. I'll never forget the day he brought in a monitor and set it up in my room. He had it connected to a camera so I could watch as he was with my wife. Beth thought it was great that he brought it in. When did the abuse stop? the counselor asked. The day Dr. Steiner came by to see me, Beth brought him and my attorney into my room just a couple of hours after Don had been there. Tim, there's a Dr. Steiner here to see you, Beth said, escorting him into my room. Dr. Steiner introduced himself and his assistant, who had a tablet. My lawyer, Alan Harrison, was also there. Tim, I'm Dr. Franklin Steiner. I'm here to discuss a possible treatment for your condition, he said. He turned to Beth. I'll take it from here, Missy. Please wait in the other room. She left, looking concerned. Dr. Steiner pulled up a chair and sat down, looking me in the eye. Now, Tim, let me explain. I run a research facility at Lake Arrowhead. 
We do groundbreaking work on 3D bone reconstruction and nerve damage implants. I think we can help you regain much of your physical capabilities. Is that something you'd be interested in? Blink once for yes and twice for no. What else could I do? Of course, I blinked once. Good, he said with a smile. Now you need to understand this is all experimental, but we have approval for human testing, and thanks to grants, it will cost you nothing. This was good news, but I was worried about the experimental part. Don't worry about it being experimental, he said, almost reading my mind. If the operation doesn't work, you won't be worse off. But I believe you are a good candidate, and I have confidence it will go well. In fact, if we succeed, you will be even stronger than before the accident. This gave me hope. I listened as he explained the procedure. They would replace all my damaged vertebrae with ones made from a strong composite material using a 3D printer. These new bones would be exact copies of the old ones, but stronger. They would also insert tiny electronic implants to help heal the damaged nerves. The operation would take three to four hours, and recovery could take several days, depending on how fast I healed. Dr. Steiner said he had already reviewed my hospital records and started making the new bones. I hope you don't mind, he said. We wanted to see if we could make the new bones based on your records. Once we knew we could, we decided to go ahead with the procedure. Once I was strong enough, I would start physical therapy, which could last a few weeks. So is this something you want to try? He asked. Blink once for yes or twice for no. I blinked once. He smiled and rubbed his hands together. Very good, he exclaimed. He motioned for his assistant to join us. Please let Mr. Robinson read the agreement. The assistant held the tablet for me to read the agreement. When I finished, Dr. Steiner asked if I agreed, instructing me to blink once for yes. I blinked once, and his assistant had me sign with my thumbprint. My lawyer, Alan, countersigned, confirming he witnessed my agreement. Are you ready to start? He asked. I blinked once. He smiled. Then let's get going. We have everything you'll need at the facility. He motioned for his assistant to wheel me out of the apartment toward a large van in the parking lot. Beth stopped us. Where are you going? She asked. Dr. Steiner looked at her. Your husband has agreed to a procedure that could help him walk again. Where are you taking him? She asked. How long will he be gone? How much will this cost? We are taking him to my facility at Lake Arrowhead, Dr. Steiner said. He could be gone for several weeks depending on how well he responds to the procedure and therapy. His doctor and lawyer are aware of everything, and the cost is not an issue. Now, if you don't mind, we need to go. Wait. I haven't seen any agreement, and I don't know what's happening. He doesn't need your approval, Mrs. Robinson, Alan said. He's disabled, not incompetent. Everything has been explained to him, and he's agreed. You do want your husband to get better, don't you? Yeah, of course, she said. I could hear the guilt in her voice. Can I at least visit him? Perhaps after the procedure, when he's up to visitors, Dr. Steiner said. Otherwise, it's best if you stay here. We'll be in touch. This would be a good time to say goodbye and wish him well. Beth came over and kissed me on the lips. Get better, sweetheart. Let me know when I can visit, okay? I couldn't say anything, but I was fuming inside. Dr. Steiner and his assistant wheeled me to the van, and the assistant got in the driver's seat. We headed out. I saw Beth standing in the parking lot watching us leave. I didn't know what she was thinking, but I felt like I was being rescued from a hostage situation. A couple of hours later, we arrived at the facility. I was taken to a nice room where several nurses began preparing me for the procedure. I hope you don't mind, Tim, but I thought it best to start right away, Dr. Steiner said. He turned to the nurses. Once he's ready, please bring him to the operating room. Yes, Dr. Steiner, one of the nurses said. Okay, Tim, I'll leave you with the nurses and I'll see you in the operating room, he told me before leaving. Soon they had me undressed, washed, and in a gown that left me exposed in the back. They placed me on a gurney and wheeled me to the operating room. Three large orderlies carefully placed me face down on the table. The anesthesiologist did his thing, and the last thing I heard before I was out was Dr. Steiner saying, Oh my. I had no idea what he was referring to. I woke up still face down, but now I was in a device that kept me still. I had a tube down my throat and an IV in my arm. A blood pressure cuff was on my right arm. The device turned, and I saw Dr. Steiner's face. You are awake, he said. Good. 
you will be happy to hear that the operation went well. We need to keep you still for a few days to ensure everything heals properly. We had to replace quite a lot. You might feel some tingling or itching in your back, which is normal and means the implants are working. The nurses will watch over you closely, and so will I. The device you're in will rotate your body from time to time. So don't be alarmed. Just try to relax for now. We'll talk in a couple of days. He checked my vitals, gave some instructions to the nurses, and left. What else could I do but relax? I did feel a tingling sensation in my back, which was annoying. I also felt itching and wanted to scratch, but I couldn't. Despite being annoying, it was nice to feel something for the first time in over a year. That night, a couple of nurses came to wash me. I could feel them washing my legs, buttocks, and back. I was shocked. I could actually feel what they were doing. They turned the bed over and washed my front. That's when I saw them. They were young and attractive, one with shoulder-length blonde hair and the other a brunette. As they washed me, I felt something else I hadn't felt in a long time. I couldn't move my head, but I could see them smile as they washed me. The blonde looked at me and said with a smile, Well, I'm no doctor, but it looks like something is working down here. They giggled, but kept working. They finished and left the room, giving me some encouragement before they left. I stayed in the device for four days. Each day was similar. X-rays were taken every morning and nurses massaged my arms and legs. Later, I got a thorough sponge bath. Each day, I could feel more of what they were doing to me. On the fourth day, Dr. Steiner came in and looked me over carefully. He sat down next to me, pulled out a pin, and quickly stuck me in the leg. I felt it and made a noise. I couldn't speak because I still had a tube in my throat. He looked at me. Did you feel that? He asked. I blinked once and tried to nod my head, but I couldn't move it. He smiled. Very good. He asked me to try moving my toes. To my surprise, I could. Then he asked me to move my fingers, which I did. Outstanding, he exclaimed. He examined my x-rays closely and called in some nurses. I think it's time we got Mr. Robinson out of this device. They removed the tube from my throat, took out my catheter, disconnected all the tubes, and unstrapped me from the device. Then they moved me to a gurney and took me to my room, placing me in a bed. He spoke to the nurses, then sat down next to me. I can't tell you how pleased I am with your results, he said. We need to start your physical therapy now, beginning with exercises you can do in bed. I don't want to put too much pressure on your back just yet. He put a cup with a straw to my mouth. Take a drink. I did, and it felt good going down my throat. Try to say something, he said after I had swallowed. Wow, I croaked. He laughed and nodded. That will do, he said. How do you feel? Like a new man, I said, my voice still very weak. I could feel my eyes start to water. This was the first time I had been able to do or say anything since the accident. He pulled out a tissue and wiped my eyes. I know this is a very emotional moment for you, Tim. For now, take it easy. Don't try to overdo it. Your back still needs to heal, but it looks like the implants are working fine. I'm concerned you may have lost some muscle mass since the accident, so we'll set you up with a diet and exercise program to help you regain muscle strength. Now, I'd like to introduce you to the staff who will take care of you. He waved his hand, and a group of young women entered the room. This is Angela, your dietitian. Ingrid will be your physical therapist, he added, pointing to a short-haired, muscular blonde. Linda will be your day nurse, he said, pointing to a petite woman with short, dark hair. And this is Kirsten, your night nurse, he added, pointing to a taller, red-haired woman. Her eyes twinkled as she smiled at me. Nice to meet you, I managed to say. If you need anything, please let us know, Dr. Steiner said. We all live here at the facility, so we're available 24 hours a day. He motioned for the women to leave the room, then turned back to me. Tim, I need to talk to you about something delicate. If you feel uncomfortable, let me know. I noticed some rectal damage when we started the procedure. I also took samples of something I found there. I'm not here to judge, but I need to know. No, I croaked, feeling embarrassed. I see, he said. So you were abused? Tears began to fall down my cheeks. Yes, I managed to say. He wiped my face before speaking. You know I have to report this to the authorities. It's a felony to abuse a disabled person. It's also considered a hate crime. I took samples and the lab is analyzing them, including DNA. Do you know who did this to you? Yes, I said quietly. 
Was your wife involved? He asked. I don't know. She was never around when he did it. I see, he said. Are you willing to name the person who did this to you? I nodded. Yes, I told him. Good. Once we have the analysis, I'll contact the authorities. In the meantime, I'll set you up with a counselor. Thanks. You're welcome. Now let's focus on getting you back on your feet, shall we? They attached a device to my bed that allowed me to lift weights while lying down, but Dr. Steiner didn't want me to use it just yet. For the first week, I did hand exercises and used a machine for leg exercises. Ingrid, my therapist, was quite strict, counting in German as I pushed with one foot then the other. Her accent was much stronger than Dr. Steiner's. She would have made a good drill instructor, I thought, as she pushed me to go faster. Good, she said. We'll get you strong again. Soon every lady in town will be after you, she added with a laugh. That brings us to the present. The counselor who had been listening to my story put down her pen and looked at me. Tim, these next few weeks will be very tough for you. The physical recovery and the emotional healing will both be hard. I'm glad you can talk to me about this. Those who abused you broke the law and need to be held accountable. I'm here for you and you can talk to me anytime, okay? Okay, thanks. With that, the session ended and I was wheeled back to my room. A couple of days later, Dr. Steiner came in with two men in dark suits and I noticed Alan was with them. After sending the nurses out, the doctor sat down next to me. Tim, these men are here to discuss your situation at home. I called your lawyer as well. I hope you don't mind. Not at all, I said. Alan seemed surprised when he heard me speak. You're looking much better, Tim, he said, standing over me. I smiled and reached out to shake his hand. He accepted and shook my hand. Thank you. I'm feeling much better. I can even eat on my own now. He's doing quite well, Dr. Steiner said. If all goes well, he'll be even stronger than he was before the accident. That's good to hear, Alan said. Tim, this is Agent Smith and Agent Jones with the state police. They're here to take your statement. Are you up to speaking with them? Absolutely. The three men pulled up chairs and Agent Smith took out a recorder. Mr. Robinson, do you mind if we record this interview? Not at all, I said. They spent the next hour taking notes and asking questions about the past four months of abuse by someone I thought was my friend. It was just as humiliating and painful to admit it again. And you say Mr. Atkins is the man who assaulted you repeatedly? Agent Smith asked. Yes, I said. I have the sample I took from Mr. Robinson along with the analysis, Dr. Steiner said. There was significant rectal damage that had to be taken care of. It's all in my report. We'll need to take that into evidence, Agent Smith said. Dr. Steiner nodded. Tell me, Mr. Robinson, Smith said. Is this the same Don Akins who works at McMaster and Williams Law Firm? Yes, it is, I said. And your wife works at this firm as well? Yes, she does, I told him. And you allege that they have been having an affair during this time? That's correct, I told him. Was she ever present when the assaults took place? Agent Smith asked. No, she was in the apartment, but never in the same room. She seemed to think he was helping me somehow. I see, said the agent. Nevertheless, we'll need to bring her in as an accessory. Even if she wasn't in the same room, it's hard to believe she didn't know something was happening. Tim, are you sure about all of this? Alan asked, shocked. I know Don Akins personally, and I find it hard to believe he would do something like this. Maybe you don't know him as well as you think, I said. You have Dr. Steiner's report and the sample. I can't explain it, Alan said. Do you want a divorce from your wife? Absolutely, he nodded. All right, I'll start the paperwork. I'll get with you before we file. Do you want a restraining order? Yes, I don't want either of them near me. I don't want them in my apartment. As of right now, we'll treat your apartment as a potential crime scene, Agent Smith said. How much longer will Mr. Robinson be here? He asked Dr. Steiner. Hard to say, the doctor replied. At least five more weeks, perhaps longer. It depends on his response to treatment and therapy. Very well, Smith said. At least he'll be safe for a while longer. He turned to his partner. Get a search warrant for the Robinson apartment and arrest warrants for Mrs. Robinson and Mr. Aikens. The other agent nodded and left the room. Smith turned back to me. Just so you know, Mr. Robinson, we're going to charge your wife as an accessory if it comes to that. Would you be willing to testify against her in court? Yes, I responded. 
Okay, he said quietly. By then, Jones had returned and gave a thumbs up. Warrants will be ready when we get back to the office. Smith nodded, packed up his gear, and took the sample from Dr. Steiner. We'll be in touch, Mr. Robinson. I hope everything works out for you. Thank you, I said. After they left, Alan came over to me. Tim, these are serious charges you're making. Don could lose everything. His job, his license, maybe even his marriage. I'm 100% certain, Alan. I frankly don't care if he loses everything. In fact, after what he's done, he deserves to lose everything. I hope you're on my side. Tell me now if you're not, and I'll find another attorney. I'm on your side, Tim. It's just hard for me to believe. I've met his wife, eaten at their home. I've never seen anything to suggest he'd do something this stupid. Well, he did, I said. Can I sue him as well? I don't see why not, Alan said. We live in one of the few states where you can sue for alienation of affection. I'll look into it, but you should know these cases don't usually go very far. I'm truly sorry about this, Tim. I had no idea. Not your fault. I had no way of letting anyone know. We said our goodbyes, and he left. I felt a bit better knowing something was going to be done. The next couple of weeks went fast. Ingrid had me up on my feet in no time. At first, I walked on a treadmill, then worked with weights. Angela put me on a high-protein, high-fiber diet, and I started noticing my muscle mass returning to normal. Meanwhile, authorities built a case against Don and Beth. Alan decided to hold the divorce papers until Beth was arrested. Agent Smith and Jones came back a few times with state prosecutors to get more information about the assaults. They told me the analysis confirmed it was Don's DNA. Alan also hired a private investigator to gather evidence of their affair. It wasn't hard since they were quite open about it. Don's wife, Kathy, didn't know about their activities because she worked nights and slept during the day. After gathering evidence, Alan came to go over it with me. He planned to file for divorce on grounds of adultery, neglect, and cruelty. He had plenty of photos, videos, and audio recordings to back up the case. I didn't want to see or hear what they had done, as I had already seen and heard enough. Alan also had papers against Don and planned to sue their firm since Beth was technically Don's subordinate, and he had violated company policy. Alan also planned to report Don to the State Bar Association for ethics violations. Beth never called the facility to check on my progress or visited to see how I was doing. Apparently, she and Don were too busy with each other to care. Oh well, I thought. This too would pass. And it did. At the end of two weeks, authorities moved in and arrested them at the firm. Alan's process server was there to deliver the papers to all parties concerned. My lawyer even alerted the media, who captured video of the two cheaters being placed in police cars. Shocked by the allegations and evidence, the firm quickly settled with Alan for most of what we asked for. They fired Don and Beth and reported Don to the state bar. Kathy heard about the arrest when Don called her from jail, asking her to come to court for his arraignment and post his bail. Agent Smith and Jones, along with Dr. Steiner, took me to the courthouse for the arraignment. Kathy saw me as I was wheeled in and came running up to me. How is he? she asked Dr. Steiner. I looked up at her. Better, I said, watching her reaction. It had been a year since she had heard me speak. Didn't you know? Your husband abused me repeatedly over four months. At the same time, he was with Beth. You didn't know? Oh my God, she said. I didn't know, Tim. Please believe me. I had no idea this was happening. I filed for divorce from Beth and am suing Don for alienation of affection. If you want, I'll give you my attorney's name in case you decide to file for divorce. Damn right I'm divorcing him, she said. We went into the courtroom and saw the sheriffs bring Don and Beth in. Both wore orange jumpsuits, their hands and feet shackled to a chain around their waist. They both looked awful. The state prosecutor asked that both be held without bail, stating that Don could be a flight risk and that a restraining order had been placed against Beth. The judge agreed, ordering them both held without bail until the hearing, set for the next week. As they led Don and Beth out, she saw me sitting in the back of the courtroom, her eyes widened as I held up my middle finger. Kathy caught up with me after Agent Smith and Jones wheeled me out of the courtroom. She stopped them and knelt down to speak to me. Tim, I'm so sorry about all this. I really didn't know. That's all right, Kathy, I told her. How long will you be gone? She asked. I don't know. Maybe a few more weeks. They've done a good job. I can even walk around some now. 
That's terrific. Please keep in touch and let me know how you're doing. I will, Kathy. We really need to go now, miss, Agent Smith said. Kathy nodded and stood up. Take care of yourself, Tim, she added. Thanks, Kathy, I said as Agent Smith wheeled me out to the van. After we got back to the facility, I was taken to the physical therapy room where Ingrid was waiting for me. About time you showed up, she said. Time to begin. She made me work hard, even giving me extra exercises for being late. I was sore but felt good when she was done. After dinner, Kirsten stayed to check my vitals and do paperwork. When she finished, she made sure I was comfortable, then sat down and looked at me for a while. Is everything okay? You seem like you have something on your mind, I asked. I was just wondering, she said. Do you find me attractive? Absolutely. I think you're a lovely girl and a great nurse. Why do you ask? It's just that, well, you haven't made a pass at me the whole time you've been here. I was wondering if I've upset you or if you don't find me attractive. I smiled before responding. I'm actually very attracted to you. It's just that I'm still married and I'm just learning to get around again. I haven't even been able to speak for a year. What about your other patients? You're my only patient, she said quietly. Dr. Steiner is very particular about who he assigns to the night shift. I see. So Dr. Steiner is not only a medical genius and miracle worker, but also a matchmaker. She laughed. It's been known to happen. Well, I'm very partial to shy, beautiful redheads and I'm getting divorced. She smiled widely, her eyes twinkling. Would it be okay if I kissed you goodnight? She asked. Absolutely. She leaned in and gave me a soft kiss. Soon the kiss turned more passionate and our tongues danced together. When she pulled away, I felt something. I'm here for you all night, every night. If you ever need anything, call me. I know your back isn't ready for sex, but I'd love to spend time with you. I promise, I said. She smiled and left the room. I thought about what she said and fell asleep with images of red-headed angels dancing in my head. The next few days flew by. Ingrid worked me harder and harder. I found that I could walk several miles on the treadmill and my muscles had strengthened to the point that I could bench press more weight than ever before. The daily x-rays showed my new vertebrae were working better than Dr. Steiner had predicted and the implants had repaired nearly all the damaged nerves. Kirsten kept me company most evenings. We watched television or talked, often sharing a bowl of popcorn. We always ended the evening with a kiss or two or three. I started to feel like a high school boy dating the prettiest girl in school. I was falling for her hard. By the time Agent Smith and Jones came to take me to Beth and Don's trial, I no longer needed the wheelchair, but Dr. Steiner insisted I use it just to be safe. He went along as a witness to my injuries and to ensure I got back in one piece. I sat in my chair behind the prosecutor with Dr. Steiner next to me. I saw Beth and Don enter the room and sit down next to their defense attorney. They glanced at me before whispering to their attorney. Kathy sat behind them, looking unhappy. The jury, selected the previous day, was seated, and soon the judge entered. Using the rail in front of me, I stood up. Don and Beth looked shocked. When the judge came in, he ordered us to be seated. Dr. Steiner asked if I was okay, and I nodded. The judge read the charges and noted that both Don and Beth had pled not guilty. After both sides gave their opening statements, the judge turned to the prosecution attorney who called me as the first witness. Dr. Steiner walked beside me to ensure I didn't fall, then returned to his seat. Don and Beth looked at each other, shocked. They were even more shocked when I spoke after being sworn in. The prosecutor began by congratulating me on my progress, then asked about my accident and the year I spent as a quadriplegic. He asked about my home life, how Beth tried to look after me but couldn't, and how Kathy had managed to get home healthcare professionals to take care of me during the day. Did your wife ever attempt to see to your emotional needs? The prosecutor asked. No, sir, I replied. Did she ever try to please you sexually? He asked. No, she did not, I said. If she had tried, would she have been successful? He asked. I shook my head. No, I had no feeling from the neck down. I see, he said. Did she ever hug you, kiss you, or spend time with you, maybe reading a book or watching television? I thought hard before answering. She sometimes gave me a peck on the cheek, but that was about it. Did she participate in your care? Did she feed you, help bathe you, or help you in the bathroom? No, she didn't, I replied. She tried at first, but she wasn't up to it. When did Mr. Akins come into the picture? Almost from the beginning, I said. Were you friends before your accident? The prosecutor asked. 
Yes, we were. They lived next door and we spent time together before my accident. I see. So you weren't surprised to see him in your apartment then? No, I thought we were friends. They often came over and we would share a beer or dinner sometimes. You say he and your wife engaged in sexual activity in your apartment? The prosecutor said. When did that start? I'm not certain. They could have been doing it while I was in the hospital, but I have no proof. He often let her cry on his shoulder. About a month after I got home from the hospital, I first heard them. Heard them? The prosecutor asked. Yes, I could hear them kissing and moaning like they were making out. Beth wiped her eyes as I recalled what I heard. Then I heard them in what used to be our bed making love. What happened then? The prosecutor asked. He would come into my room and taunt me while she showered. One day he brought in a monitor in a box and told me it was so I could watch a real man with my wife. That brought gasps from Beth in the jury. Your Honor, the prosecutor said as the bailiff wheeled out a cart with a large monitor and a black box. This is the monitor and box Mr. Robinson is referring to. The box is a digital video recorder. The system also included two video cameras, one set up in Mr. Robinson's master bedroom and another in the room where he stayed. We copied several hours of video recorded by the device. The prosecutor turned back to me. Is it your testimony that Mr. Atkins used this so you could watch him with your wife? He asked. Yes, I said quietly. Beth looked at Don, shocked. You scum sucker, she said. The judge pounded his gavel. Order in the court, he said. Beth quieted down and the prosecutor continued. Did you know that Mr. Aikens placed a camera in your room in the master bedroom? He asked me. I shook my head. This was news to me. No, sir, I didn't. How did your wife react to this monitor? The prosecutor asked. She thought it was wonderful that he had gotten it for me. She thought it was so I could watch sports on television. Was it about this time that the abuse against you began? The prosecutor asked. Yes, it was, I said. Please tell the court what would typically happen, the prosecutor said. After Don and my wife had their fun, he would come into my room and turn the monitor off. Then he would lift me up and assault me. Is it your testimony that he assaulted you? The prosecutor asked. Yes, I replied, embarrassed. Was your wife ever present when this took place? The prosecutor asked. Not that I'm aware of. He always seemed to finish about the time she was done with her shower. Afterward, she would come into my room and tell me how wonderful it was that we had a friend like Don to help look after me. How often did this happen? About two or three times a week, I said. For how long? The prosecutor asked. About four months. I heard members of the jury gasp, and some of them glared at Beth and Don with hatred in their eyes. Beth looked down at the table as Don sat stoic, looking straight ahead. So you estimate that this happened about 35 times overall? The prosecutor asked. About that, yes, I said. Were you aware that Mr. Aikens recorded his time in your room? He asked me. I shook my head. No, I wasn't. The prosecutor looked at the jury. In fact, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Aikens recorded himself abusing Mr. Robinson 36 times on this device, he said. He paused as the jury took that in. With friends like that, who needs enemies? the prosecutor asked rhetorically. The defense attorney objected and the judge sustained the objection. That's all I have for this witness at this time, but I reserve the right to recall Mr. Robinson to the stand, the prosecutor said. Very well, the judge said. Your witness, Mr. Green, he said to the defense attorney. Green stayed at his table and looked up at me before speaking. Mr. Robinson, I am sorry to hear of your injuries and I do hope you get better. Thank you, I said. Just one thing, he continued. At any time, did you ever indicate to Mr. Atkins that you did not approve of his actions? I wasn't able to. I was completely disabled at the time, and I couldn't even speak. So the answer is no, then, he said. That's because I couldn't, I said, getting irritated. You also failed to inform anyone what happened, not even your wife. Isn't that true? He asked. Now I was pissed. That's because I was completely disabled and couldn't. You moron! I yelled, slamming my fist down on the heavy wood rail in front of me. For a moment, no one said anything. When I moved my hand away, I saw that I had cracked the railing. I didn't realize I had hit it that hard. I looked at the judge before speaking. I'm sorry, Your Honor, I lost my temper. Don't do it again, he warned me. I nodded. That's all I have for this witness, Green said. The judge indicated that I could leave the stand, and Dr. Steiner came to walk me back to my seat. 
The prosecutor then called Dr. Steiner to the stand. He told the court about my injuries and the extent of my disability. He explained that he had found significant damage, took samples for evidence and testing, and did what he could to heal the damage. He also explained the surgery he performed and my progress since the surgery. In your professional opinion, the only way for this damage to have been done is for Mr. Robinson to have been assaulted. Is that right? The prosecutor asked. Correct, Dr. Steiner said. It would also explain the presence of evidence. Thank you, the prosecutor said. He turned to the jury. Ladies and gentlemen, that sample was tested by the state. Further testing and DNA analysis proves with 99.99% certainty that the defendant, Mr. Donald Akins, is responsible. The prosecutor turned to the judge. That is all I have for this witness, Your Honor. The judge nodded. Your witness, Mr. Green. Mr. Green stood up. Thank you, Dr. Steiner. You run the Arrowhead Institute of Advanced Medical Research, correct? Yes, that is correct, Dr. Steiner said. You engage in some pretty cutting-edge research there, do you not? Green asked. Sure, Dr. Steiner said, slipping into his native German accent. Green pulled out a piece of paper and began reading. Each of us has various defense mechanisms to help us cope with extreme situations. Sometimes we fall back on an alternate version of ourselves, what could be described as an alter ego. This alter ego could manifest in many ways. A normally quiet, unassuming person could suddenly become boisterous, arrogant, and overbearing. For example, those not familiar with this behavior from that person would have a much different opinion of him or her. He looked back up at Dr. Steiner. You also write about something called an inner beast that lays dormant within each of us. According to your writings, you claim to have found a way to unleash that beast to deal with particular situations. Is that true? Yes. My research has found that to be the case, Dr. Steiner said. Is it not true that you once worked with a Mr. Bill Dalton and helped him find his alleged inner beast? Just yes or no will do, Green said. I worked with Mr. Dalton, yes, Dr. Steiner said. The exact nature of my work, however, is confidential. Is it not true that toward the end of his treatment, Mr. Dalton's house mysteriously blew up, Green asked. The prosecutor immediately objected. Irrelevant, Your Honor. Your Honor, Green said. We all witnessed Mr. Robinson's reaction. If you'll allow me, I think there is a connection. I'll allow it for the moment, Mr. Green, the judge said. But please make your point and move on. Thank you, Your Honor, Green said. He turned back to Dr. Steiner. Are you aware of what happened to Mr. Dalton's home? I remember seeing something about it on the news, Dr. Steiner said. The police said that Mrs. Dalton and her live-in lover were making drugs using highly volatile materials. I don't see the connection to this case. According to police reports, Mrs. Dalton was seen running out of the house screaming about a monster, Green said. Apparently a result of the drugs she and her lover were making, Dr. Steiner said. Your Honor, this is completely irrelevant to the case before the court today, and Mr. Green knows that. I insist this line of questioning be stopped the prosecutor said. I tend to agree. I've been more than fair, Mr. Green. Please move on. Very well, Your Honor. I have no further questions for this witness, Green said. The judge dismissed Dr. Steiner, and the case continued. The prosecutor called the state agents who searched my apartment. Both of them said they found evidence suggesting physical abuse. Then he called home health care nurses who testified that they noticed signs of abuse. They noted it in their records, but the reports fell through the cracks. I have one last piece of evidence, Your Honor, the prosecutor said. With your permission, I would like to play a portion of a video taken of the abuse against Mr. Robinson. Very well, the judge said. The prosecutor looked at the jury. Ladies and gentlemen, what I am about to show you is shocking. I take no joy in this, but I believe it is necessary for you to see what Mr. Robinson endured for months. He turned on the monitor and began playing the video. The jury grimaced as they watched. Don could clearly be seen. The prosecutor paused the video and enlarged the picture. Ladies and gentlemen, let there be no doubt who is committing this heinous act to a man who once thought of him as a friend, he said. After the jury looked at the picture for a few moments, tears started falling down my face in shame. The prosecutor paused the video again. I rest my case he said with disgust. 
Mr. Green, you may present your case, the judge said. Green got up and called Beth to the stand. Mrs. Robinson, is it true that you had a sexual affair with Mr. Akins? Yes, it is, she said quietly. Can you tell us why? he asked. My husband Tim was injured so badly and I felt lost and hopeless, she said. He was there when I needed a shoulder to cry on. Yes, we had sex, but that's all it was. Just sex, nothing more. Were you aware of what Mr. Akins did to your husband? Green asked. No, I wasn't. If you had known, would you have done anything to stop him? Green asked. Yes, I would have. Thank you, Mrs. Robinson. That's all for now, Green said, sitting down. The prosecutor got up and walked to the monitor. He went to an image on the video that clearly showed both my face and Beth in the same frame. Mrs. Robinson, you testified that you had no idea your husband was being abused. Is that correct? Yes. Look at his face in that video, the prosecutor said. The hurt and humiliation were obvious to anyone looking at the video. Do you expect this court to believe that you could look at your husband of three years in that condition and not know that something was wrong? It didn't cross my mind at the time, she said. Before Mrs. Akins brought home health care workers into the home, did you ever once feed him or clean your husband? The prosecutor asked. I tried, but I wasn't very good at it, she said. What about afterward? Did you even try to help? No, she said quietly. And why was that? The prosecutor asked. I don't know. I thought Don was helping him, and I really didn't know what to do. The truth is, you basically abandoned him, didn't you? The prosecutor asked, causing an objection from Green. I withdraw the question, Johnson quickly said. You said your affair with Mr. Akins was purely sexual, correct? That's right, she said, and you claimed in your testimony that you still love your husband, right? Yes. Walking back to his table, Johnson pulled out an audio recorder and a folder from his briefcase. He walked back to the bench. Your Honor, this is a written report by Samuel Jenkins, a private investigator hired by Mr. Robinson's attorney, he said, handing the report to the judge. A copy of this report and the audio was provided to Mr. Green, as the accompanying affidavit shows. The report references an audio recording of a conversation between the defendants made during a dinner date shortly after Mr. Robinson was admitted to Arrowhead. With your permission, I'd like to play that audio for the jury. Very well, the judge said. Johnson pressed a button on the recorder, and the courtroom could hear a conversation between Beth and Don. So, have you given any thought to what we discussed? Don's voice said on the audio. I have, and I admit I'm intrigued, Beth said. Well, what do you think? Don asked. I have to admit these last several months with you have been terrific, she said in the recording. Much better than my life with Tim has ever been. Are you sure we can pull this off? Of course, Don said. I'm a lawyer, you know. I can get a judge to do whatever I want. Getting Tim declared a ward of the state would be a piece of cake. He can't take care of himself, and it's obvious you're not trained to take care of him. Frankly, I can't stomach the idea of it, she said. I mean feeding him like a baby, wiping his drool, changing his diaper and washing his butt. Yuck! It makes me sick just thinking about it. I need a man, a whole man, a real man like you. You and I both know this Steiner guy won't be able to do anything for him, Don said. All the doctors said he would be an invalid for the rest of his life. Once we get him declared incompetent, we can get hold of that huge settlement of his and go live like kings in Costa Rica or someplace. Wouldn't that be better than staying here wiping the shit off little Timmy's butt? Yeah, it would, she said. What about Kathy, though? What about her? Don said. Look, things haven't been that great between us for a long time. She wants kids, but I don't. And I'm frankly getting tired of her constant nagging anyway. I just want to make sure that you're not going to go soft on me and tell me you still love him after we get things rolling. That won't happen. I love you and only you. The prosecutor stopped the audio and looked at Beth. I felt as if my heart had just been torn out again. So you and your lover plan to have your husband declared incompetent so you could grab his settlement money and run off to Costa Rica. Were you telling your lover the truth? Or were you telling the truth here in court? Which is it, Mrs. Robinson? Please tell me now so I know whether or not to charge you with perjury. Tears ran down her face as she was forced to face her own duplicity publicly. I don't know, she cried. I still loved him, but I loved Don too. She looked over at me. Please, Tim, forgive me. I shook my head and looked away from her. 
Johnson looked at her in disgust. I'm done with this witness, he said, walking away. The judge excused her, and Green called Don to the stand. So, Mr. Akins, Green began after Don was sworn in, we've seen video of you and Mr. Robinson. There's no denying what we all saw. I just have one question. At any time, did Mr. Robinson indicate to you that he did not consent to your actions? Not once, Don said with a sneer. Thank you, Green said, turning away. Your witness, he told Johnson, who was already on his feet. Mr. Akins, Johnson began, you graduated from Harvard Law School, did you not? Yes, I did, Don stated proudly. And you graduated near the top of your class, didn't you? I did. In fact, you're highly regarded as a top litigator in your firm, Johnson said. Green objected. Relevance, Your Honor. Your Honor, I intend to show that Mr. Akins not only knows the law, but he knew that Mr. Robinson could not possibly have denied consent. Go ahead, Mr. Johnson, the judge said. Thank you, Johnson said. He turned back to Don. You knew that Mr. Robinson was disabled, didn't you? Don sighed but said nothing. Didn't you? Johnson bellowed. Yes, I knew, Don responded. And you knew that the law in this state says persons with Mr. Robinson's disabilities are incapable of giving consent, didn't you? Johnson asked. Yes, I guess so. Johnson looked at him with disgust for a few moments, then shook his head. I'm finished with this witness, Johnson said, walking away. Any more witnesses, Mr. Green? The judge asked. Green shook his head. No, Your Honor, I rest my case. Very well, we'll take 15 minutes and reconvene to hear closing arguments. He pounded his gavel, and everyone left the courtroom. Dr. Steiner handed me a cup of water. How are you holding up? He asked as I sipped the water. I'll be okay, I told him. He patted me on the shoulder. Good. Johnson turned to see how I was doing. I'm sorry you had to relive all that, he told me. I think we've made an impression on the jury. We'll see. This is almost over, Tim. Hang in there. Thanks, I said. Soon enough, the break was over, and everyone came back into the courtroom. Don, Beth, and Mr. Green didn't look as confident as they did earlier in the day. Kathy looked angry enough to spit nails. This was the first time she had heard much of this. The bailiff had everyone stand when the judge came back in. All right, Mr. Green, present your closing statement. Green stood up and faced the jury. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, this is not an easy case for any of us. And contrary to what you might believe, we do hope that Mr. Robinson gets better. We've admitted that the assault happened to Mr. Robinson. We're not arguing that point. But this case is about consent or the lack of it. Mr. Robinson admitted under oath that he never once indicated to my client that he did not give consent. Mrs. Robinson had no clue there was anything wrong, and she never knew the assault had taken place. Therefore, you have no choice but to find my client not guilty. Thank you. He took his seat and the judge motioned for Johnson to give his closing remarks. On the way, Johnson turned on the monitor and showed the image of Don abusing me. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, thank you for your service today. I know this has been very hard on all of you. The defense has tried to confuse the issue, claiming that Mr. Robinson never indicated he did not consent. There's only one problem. Mr. Robinson was disabled. He could not speak and he could not defend himself. Under the law in this state, persons with disabilities like his are incapable of giving or denying consent. Mr. Green knows this. So does the defendant, Akins, who, by the way, is a well-trained Harvard lawyer. They have admitted to the acts against Mr. Robinson. You've seen the video. You've heard the audio. You know the defendants intended to fraudulently have Mr. Robinson declared incompetent to take what is rightfully his and flee the country. The defendant, Atkins, took Mr. Robinson's wife, and he intended to take Mr. Robinson's money, leaving his own wife high and dry. You've heard the defendant's plot and scheme against Mr. Robinson. The defense has not provided any doubt about what took place. Thirty-six times the defendant, Akins, abused Mr. Robinson. In each case, Mrs. Robinson did nothing to stop it. In this state, abuse and intentional neglect of a disabled person is classified as a hate crime— that's why I'm pushing for the maximum punishment allowed by law. The state has done its job. Now I ask that you do yours and give Mr. Robinson the justice he deserves. Thank you. After Johnson took his seat, the judge gave his orders to the jury and sent them off to deliberate. He then put the rest of the court into recess. 
Dr. Steiner and I went into the hallway where Alan was waiting. I just wanted to let you know that Beth signed the divorce papers, he said. She's not contesting anything. I just got back from filing them. The judge will sign off on them in a day or two, and in six months, you'll be a free man. Free? I asked sarcastically. Why don't I feel free then? You've been through a lot, young man, Dr. Steiner said. Trust me, it'll get better. I hope so. And I think I know just the person who can help you feel better, the doctor said with a knowing smile. You mean Kirsten? I asked. Dr. Steiner smiled and nodded. Yeah, he said. She really likes you, you know. It was my turn to smile. I like her too, a lot. Good, Dr. Steiner said. Just be careful, though. I don't want you having sex for at least another six to eight weeks. I don't want to see you put too much strain on your back just yet, he added with a smile. By the way, I added, what's the deal with that rail? How did I manage to crack that thing? I barely slapped it. Must be the supplements we've been giving you. That and Ingrid's physical therapy, he said. Nothing to do with that inner beast stuff? He laughed. No, not at all. That's a whole different project. Besides, I wouldn't recommend that for you. Not with the custom-built vertebrae we've put in. We talked for a while longer, and after about an hour, Johnson stuck his head into the hallway. Jury's back in already? I asked. He nodded. That was fast. Yeah, it was, Johnson said. Hopefully that's good news for us. We went through the motions again as everyone filed back into the courtroom. The bailiff instructed us all to rise as the judge entered. Then we all took our seats on his signal. Has the jury reached a decision? He asked. We have, the jury foreman announced. The bailiff took the sheet from the foreman and handed it to the judge. After he read it to himself, he instructed Beth and Don to stand up. Green stood with them. On the charges against defendant Donnie Atkins, how do you find, the judge asked. We find the defendant, Don Akins, guilty on all charges, the foreman said. And on the charges against defendant Beth Robinson, how do you find? We find the defendant, Beth Robinson, not guilty on the charge of accessory to abuse of a disabled person and guilty on all other charges, the foreman said. The judge nodded. Very well, he said turning to the defendants. I have seen and heard a lot in this courtroom over the years, but I have never seen or heard anything as outrageous and egregious as I have witnessed here today. The two of you, frankly, make me sick to my stomach. Not only have you made a mockery of your marriages, you have made a mockery of the legal profession. That's why I'm giving you the maximum sentences allowed by law. Mr. Akins, as a well-trained lawyer and an officer of the court, your actions disgust me beyond words. Upon the prosecutor's request, I am sentencing you to no less than 450 years at hard labor. That's 12 years for each of the 36 counts of abuse, along with 20 years added for committing a hate crime. I've also added 8 years for conspiracy to commit fraud. Mrs. Robinson, I do not agree with the jury's not guilty verdict. I personally do not see how any person with more than two brain cells could not know the abuse against your husband was taking place. Nevertheless, I will abide by the verdict. I am, however, giving you the maximum sentence for criminal neglect, negligence, and conspiracy to commit fraud, which under the state guidelines totals 15 years in prison, making you eligible for parole in 10. He raised his gavel, but Green addressed the judge. Your Honor, he said, Mrs. Robinson has just informed me that divorce papers have been filed and she would like to speak with Mr. Robinson before she is taken into custody. Are you okay with that, Mr. Robinson? The judge asked. I can give her a couple minutes, Your Honor, I said. He nodded. Very well. He pounded his gavel and declared the court dismissed. Beth walked over to me as deputies prepared to take Don away. You look good, Tim, she said. Thank you, I responded. I just wanted to tell you that I'm sorry about all of this. I really had no idea what he was doing to you. I would have done whatever I could to stop it if I had known. I think you convinced the jury of that, I said. I agree with the judge, though. I find it hard to believe. You're not a stupid woman. At any rate, you'll have 15 years to think about it. Was there something else? Yes, she replied. I wanted you to know I signed the divorce papers, and I'm not going to fight you over it. That's what I heard, I told her. Don't you want to know why it happened? She asked. I shook my head. I really don't care. 
I'm sure it was all for greed and lust. You cheated on me, plain and simple. The why doesn't matter anymore. Do you think you could ever forgive me? She asked. Why is it all you cheating people think you can come crawling and begging for forgiveness? I asked. You sure didn't care about me when I needed you the most? To answer your question, no. I don't intend to ever forgive you. Instead, I'm going to do my best to forget you exist. Was there something else? I know you won't believe me, but I do love you, she said. I just wanted to tell you that before they take me to jail. You're right. I don't believe you. But thanks for saying so anyway. I think you better get going. Those deputies don't look too happy over there. Okay, goodbye, Tim. With that, she walked away, tears in her eyes. At that point, I felt absolutely nothing for her. As I got up, Kathy came over to me. How are you, Tim? You look better than you have in a long time. Thanks, I'm doing much better. Thanks to Dr. Steiner here. I just wanted to apologize for what my soon-to-be ex-husband did to you. I appreciate that, I told her. Did you get in touch with Alan? Yes, I did. Don's father insisted we get a prenuptial agreement before we got married, and it has a very strict infidelity clause in it, so Alan's going to have a field day with it. I'm glad to hear it, I told her. If there's anything I can do to help, let me know. Thanks. I may need to borrow some copies of those videos from you. No problem, I replied. Whatever you need. I'll be gone for a bit longer, but I'm sure Alan can use what he already has. One last thing, she said. I still have that key you guys gave me right after the accident. I'll get your place cleaned up and get Beth's things out of there if you want. That would be a big help, Kathy. Thanks. No problem. Good luck, and I'll see you soon, she added, giving me a kiss on the cheek. We watched as she left. I couldn't believe how stupid Don was to cheat on such a good woman. Are you finished flirting with all the women? Dr. Steiner asked. I'd like to get back to work, if you don't mind. Works for me, I said. But how are we going to get back? No problem. We'll take care of that for you, Agent Smith said from behind us. After all, we're the ones who brought you here at Dr. Steiner's insistence. I sat down in the wheelchair and he took me out to the car where we all piled in. Actually, I was a bit relieved to have the wheelchair. I had been up and down most of the day and I was feeling a bit tired and achy. We got back to the facility and Dr. Steiner wheeled me into my room where Kirsten was waiting for me. After dinner, she helped get me ready for bed. Then she went into the bathroom and changed into her sleepwear, which was actually just a long t-shirt. How are you feeling? She asked when she climbed into bed with me. Wiped. It's been a long day. She kissed me and laid her head on my shoulder. Yes, it has, she said. I know it's been hard, but it had to be done. Now you can start putting all that behind you, and I'll be here to help in any way I can. I looked into her face for a while before speaking. I love you, Kirsten, I said without thinking. She smiled sweetly and kissed me on the lips. And I love you, Tim. She put her head on my shoulder and draped an arm over my chest. I felt happier than I had in a very long time. Soon we were both asleep. They ran me ragged over the next five weeks. Ingrid's inner drill instructor came out, pushing me to go farther and faster with each session. On top of that, I was making twice weekly visits with the counselor to help me get past the abuse I suffered over the previous year. Every day they took x-rays to check the status of my spine. Kirsten spent every night in my bed and we got to know each other quite well. Finally, Dr. Steiner announced that I had healed well enough that I could be sent home. By then my body was in better shape than it had ever been but he instructed me to refrain from sex for another three weeks. He also scheduled me to come in twice a month for the next year so they could do a checkup on my back. I was anxious to get back home, but I also knew I would miss Kirsten. The day I was scheduled to leave, I wrote a note telling her of my feelings for her. I also invited her to come visit me anytime she wished. I finished the note as Dr. Steiner came into my room with a wheelchair. I looked at him confused. I was able to walk on my own by now, after all. He shrugged his shoulders. Regulations, he said. I understand. As I sat in the wheelchair, I hoped to never sit in one of these things again. Dr. Steiner wheeled me to the pickup area outside, and I looked around, waiting for the Arrowhead van to show up. Instead, a dark blue Toyota RAV4 pulled up. The driver's side door opened, and I saw her. Kirsten, my red-headed angel of mercy. She came around and opened the passenger door for me. Surprised? 
I looked at Dr. Steiner. Kirsten has a new assignment. She'll be your live-in caretaker, that is, unless you have any objections. Absolutely not, I said, smiling. I shook his hand. Thank you, Dr. Steiner, for everything. You're welcome, he said with a smile. I'll see you in a couple of weeks. He looked at Kirsten. And please take care of our boy, okay? I will, she said with a smile. After helping me inside, she got in the car. I noticed several bags packed in the back. So how long are you going to be assigned to me? That depends on how long you need me. How long do you think that might be? I asked. Conservative estimate? I'd say at least 60 years. Is that okay with you? Damn straight it is, I said. She kissed me on the lips, then pulled out and headed home. When we got home, I marked the date on the calendar when Dr. Steiner said I could start having sex. As it turned out, that just happened to be the day after my divorce from Beth was final. And yes, we did make love on the day I had marked on the calendar. But it was much more than just sex. As Alan had predicted, my alienation of affection lawsuit against Don didn't go very far. But that was okay. Kathy had eviscerated him in her divorce. Kathy stayed in the apartment she had shared with Don and became good friends with Kirsten. About two years after her divorce, she fell in love with a doctor and got married. I never visited Beth in prison, but I learned that she was going through counseling. After 15 years, she was released on parole and got a job as a waitress in a truck stop diner out on the highway. Kirsten and I tied the knot about six months after my divorce was final. That was a good thing, since she informed me a few weeks after we returned from Hawaii that we were going to be parents. We had two more children after that and decided that would be enough for the time being. Our love for each other never waned, and when our youngest child left for college, we celebrated with a round-the-world cruise. Even after all these years, she's still my beautiful red-headed angel of mercy. My vertebrae got stronger, and it seemed that I was in better health than I had ever been. The implants did their job, and all the nerve damage I suffered from the accident had been reversed. Dr. Steiner performed the operation successfully several more times over the next ten years, and the procedure now awaits final approval. As I look back on my life now, I can't help but think about that quote by John Milton that every cloud has a silver lining. Yes, I went through hell for a year after that truck ran me over. That was my dark cloud. But what I have now would put any silver lining to shame. Hey listeners, if you enjoyed watching this video and want to stay updated with our latest content, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications. You won't want to miss out on what's coming next. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video with Queen Cheating Tales.